welcome to the inaugural edition of Masters of Marketing 2022. I'm Basuta Agarwal and I lead Inmobi's Asia Pacific business. I'm joined today by an extraordinary panel who leads some of India's most famous brands. I'd like to invite them to introduce themselves. Ravi Santhanam, CMO HDFC Bank. Thank you, Vasudha. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ravi, Ravi Santhanam. I head marketing, corporate communication, and products and manage programs at HDFC Bank. Happy to share my thoughts and learn from all the panelists. Thanks, Ravi. Um, Ishminder Singh, GM Marketing at Parno Ricard. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ishwinder. I mean, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure being here. I've been with uh, Paroreka for about three years now, and I've had about 20 years of experience in the alcohol beverages industry. Thank you, Ishwinder. Uh, Anjali Krishnan, Consumer Experience Lead at Mondelez International. Hi, Vasutha. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anjali Krishnan. I'm the Consumer Experience Lead at Mondelez. Um, in my role, I handle digital data and paid owned and earned media. Uh, I have close to about 20 years of experience in this industry and happy to be here to chat with everybody else on the panel. Thank you, Anjali. Um, next panelist, Sandeep Anand, EVP and CMO at Domino's. Thanks, Vasudha. Hello, everyone. Great to be here and look forward to a great discussion. In terms of my introduction, uh, I work at Domino's and lead the marketing function here. Also in the past, I've worked in companies like GSK, Racket, and Zomato. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, and finally, Anuja Mishra, VP and Head of Marketing, Personal Care and Hygiene at Godridge. Hey everyone, this is Anuja Mishra. Uh, I head the category of Personal Wash and Hygiene at Godridge Consumer. Uh, a marketer with about 18 years of industry experience uh, across organizations like Nestle, Pepsi, and uh, GCPL. Uh, very, very excited to be part of the Masters of Marketing 2022 program and uh, look forward to interacting with my fellow panelists and, uh, and some great learning. Thank you. Thank you, Anuja. So thank you all for joining us today. Before we dive into the discussion, I'd like to set some context as to why we're all here. The events of the past two years have dramatically reshaped life as we know it and has permanently moved the consumer landscape. Naturally, this has also been an unusual time for marketers across India, but we all know that true innovation comes from adversity. This couldn't be more true in a country like ours, where we saw the heralding of a new era in digital India. According to a stat by Tri, India became home to over 825 million internet subscribers in 2021, a majority of whom have been powered by smartphones, proving that we are truly living in a mobile first age. And in this new age, we have seen that resilient brands are the ones that have pioneered innovations to pivot, strategize, and execute. As these brands build multi-moment mobile marketing strategies, some brands have really set the bar high, not just for themselves, but for us as a community. Today, we are in conversation with the leaders of some of these iconic brands. So let's get started. Uh, I'll ask the first question to Sandeep. So Sandeep, Domino's is one of the most exciting brands in the country today. And you seem to have very quickly pivoted in the face of the pandemic. So much of your communication became about zero contact delivery, buy online, pick up offline. And all of this was centered around mobile. And Domino's is now interestingly also among the top three food apps consistently in India. So tell us a little bit about this journey uh, that Domino's has been on in the last 20 months. Sure. So, uh, Vasta, I would actually start with what were the fundamental changes in consumer behavior which started during the COVID time. And the, uh, here I'm talking about the first wave of COVID itself. One, when the first wave hit, there was paranoia all around. And actually, uh, when it came to all categories and not just food, and particularly in food, actually, consumers gravitated towards more trusted brands. And Domino's being in India for the last 25 odd years, is one of the brands which is trusted the most by consumers and therefore we were a natural choice when it came to, to consumers' preference in terms of which brand they would order from. The second big change which happened was the 
adoption of mobile as a way of ordering or way of living life because it was while Swiggy and Zomato were there and they had to a certain extent popularized the <clears throat> use of mobile apps for food ordering. That happened, the adoption of uh, mobile apps, et cetera, happened across various categories, be it payment, be it even grocery, be it even medicines to some extent. Every category gravitated towards moving to a mobile app-based business. And uh, Domino's was at a, therefore, a very kind of a sweet spot there, wherein we had a significant infrastructure and presence with our own mobile app. At the same time, we enjoyed a very good consumer confidence in terms of trust and safety, which was there. Furthermore, we also from our part uh, enhanced and brought in a lot of new safety procedures and steps at the store during delivery, et cetera. And of course, we shared it with consumers that these are the steps we are taking to ensure your safety. In fact, for the first five to six months of the pandemic, I think our communication was solely focused on how safe a Domino's pizza is. So a culmination of all these things that consumers move towards mobile app, they move towards trusted app, and the fact that Domino's took a lot of steps to enhance the safety perception as well as the uh, safety of the consumers really paid dividends to us. So we were one of the few brands which kind of braved out braved out the first wave relatively better. I won't say it was, it would be always be relatively better versus many other brands. Got it, Sandeep. No, that's an interesting, absolutely, right? Because like you mentioned, right, categories like uh, food delivery, hyper-local commerce, fintech, right? These did benefit a lot from having a mobile presence already. So, you know, on that note, Ravi, similar to Domino's, even HDFC has been a category dominator across the app stores, especially in a space such as finance, uh, where you're not only competing with other banks, but also other fintech solutions like payments and now, you know, crypto and so on. So tell us how you've been able to sort of break out of that uh, clutter when it comes to mobile. First, uh, I'll just uh, leverage on what just Sandeep said. The difference between, say, for example, a physical food delivery versus a bank is, see, we were already mobile, we were already net enabled, and more than 95% of our transactions were digital prior to COVID. So what really happened is the change in the way people accepted digital for doing things differently. So from a transaction, which was mostly in the mobile and the internet banking world, we also had the origination shift to digital. So that was the biggest pivot for a brand like us. People still believed that to purchase a credit card, to take a loan or to take an insurance policy, they wanted somebody to come and meet it across the table and do it. And this is not only from the consumer, but it's also from our own employees and the salespeople. So digital, while on the transaction front is much more deeper penetrated, but on the origination front is not necessarily at the same level. And there was a lot of regulatory hindrance with respect to KYC and multiple other things that we need to do where we need to have a physical presence verified and all. So what the pandemic did is the regulatory outlook towards these kind of physical presence required actually moved. So we had a digital customer premise verification enabled. We had a digital KYC enabled with other EKYC and other stuff. So those were now the regulators came forward and gave us a lot of leeway in terms of doing things digitally. Our own people, because of the fact that they couldn't go out and meet people, how do you actually sell now? So they also started adopting digital to start selling. So the biggest impact for a brand like HDFC Bank and almost for the entire financial ecosystem is the salesman ability to use digital to start selling. And we do expect over a period of time that direct digital selling where we are extremely good at as of now, long way to go, but that will also start picking up where we don't necessarily have to meet a person to start selling. That's where the big difference we saw in our uh, world. Anujab, with Godrej being a leader in the personal care space, your products became lifelines for the country at the time of the pandemic. But at the same time, there was a lot of you know clutter in the personal care space with new brands and products entering the market very quickly. So yeah. what was your strategy at Goodrich, uh, especially during the second lockdown for breaking out of this clutter? 
so uh, thanks for the question, Vasu. That's a very relevant one. Uh, you know, there were I think the the first and the second lockdown were really you know tales of two halves in a way. Uh, and while in the first one, like you rightly said, there was a lot of clutter. There were you know a lot of uh, organizations going ahead and you know really sort of uh, you know head diving first into the hygiene category and a lot of launches there. Um, our strategy was very simple, you know, I, I think pretty much for the last one and a half years across lockdowns and beyond. You know, one was, you know, to of course focus on very relevant uh, product innovations. Uh, and that included categories that we felt were relevant here and now, you know, to kind of um, uh, manage and handle the chaos uh, that, that people were talking of. And equally categories that we saw would, would potentially become very sustained into people's lifestyles even going forward you know because there are certain hygiene behaviors that we've now adopted which seem like they're here to stay uh, uh, and the second and more important part Pasada, aside just the launch of products was building a very distinct identity and communicating with consumers in a very authentic manner i'd say uh, you know in the midst of a lot of information being thrown at them so uh, you know what we really did at that time Pasada, was in fact, trebled, you know, our rate of interaction with consumers, um, you know, and technology really sort of, you know, helped us do that. But what we realized when we spoke with consumers was that the one thing that they were actually leaning on brands, uh, you know, for at that point was, was, uh, you know, certain direction and trust, you know, because they really were feeling very vulnerable. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of information being thrown at them. And at that moment, you know, they said that we, we only want to lean on brands that we can trust. And for us at GCPL, you know, we, we've got a great range of trusted brands. Godridge really stands for trust in people's lives. And we said, you know, even for some of the newer brands that we'd, you know, expanded uh, into the hygiene category with Protect at this time, we said, you know, we're going to continue that, uh, you know, that spirit. Um, and ensure that we're giving people the right kind of information. So, you know, information which is very factual, you know, very much about the product. And at the same time, somewhere just giving them a, you know, very calming tonality, you know, so not really creating that fear in their mind, but, you know, helping them, uh, you know, sort of get over the fear uh, while, you know, alerting them and while sort of ensuring them that the brand is partnering with them in this journey. So I think it was a, it was a fairly, you know, I'd say overwhelming experience for everyone, but we were very clear that staying anchored on consumer listening and being very sharp in, uh, you know, our proposition uh, and very soft in our tonality, uh, you know, would be extremely critical to, to build the brand and to also, uh, uh, you know, dis possibly even distinguish ourselves from a lot of noise and clutter as you spoke of. Right. Uh, let's switch gears and, you know, uh, Ishwinder, moving to you. Um, yours is a very different category from the rest of the panelists. Uh, and given that the needs of your consumers must have changed dramatically during the pandemic, and especially with the lockdowns uh, across different states uh, having, you know, such a big impact on the category, how did you adapt your marketing strategy to build brand resilience uh, in the last 20 odd months? So I would basically say that in a different category, we have our own unique set of constraints. Okay, We are a heavily regulated category. However, we thrive on addressing a consumer through innovation and through targeted comms, through by channel, okay, by focusing on one common aim, and that is to drive a strong rational and emotional connect with our consumers. Okay. And that really changed when the lockdown really came into play. The average spend, time spent on mobile devices, in fact, increased pretty drastically because there was hardly any fresh content which was coming on television. And in fact, conviviality and consumer engagement at the last three feet had changed drastically during lockdown. Outlets were closed, okay? And consumers were buying and consuming at home. Basically, what really happened was that consumer behavior evolved in lockdown and therefore we had changed our marketing mix, obviously in favor of digital. We had to be agile with our narrative and with our content mix. And look, historically, physical engagement has been a very important piece of, you know, basically talking and working with our consumers. We moved on to a complete digital outreach. We had to become a lot more topical. 
our intensity and our frequency of of engagement with the consumers really went up and we in fact innovated very strongly by creating seamless consumer digital a word which did not exist before you know a uh, lockdown digital uh, experiences like showcase and like our world cup activations in fact influencers started playing a very important role for us because what they really did was they started communicating a brand narrative to a consumer and help us reach you know to a larger set of consumers as compared to before so for us it was a pretty drastic change but i think we were pretty agile and nimble to go quickly and take advantage at that point in time no absolutely i think you know like you talked about i think the digital uh, you know as a notion it probably existed somewhere but it really come to the forefront now uh, i think across uh, your category but you know possibly even across all others Uh, so it's it's definitely interesting to see how you uh, shape that with a lot of agility uh, at your end um anjali the next question is for you um this of course you know has been a very buzz uh, you know i would say incredible year uh, for montlay with a lot of buzzworthy campaigns um we had the uh, iconic dairy milk campaign with the gender flip um the not just a cadbury ad campaign with the whole use of ai technology I mean, these are great examples of how uh, Mondelez is marrying creativity with technology uh, to drive brand purpose at scale. So, can you share a little bit more about this approach? Um, Masuda, actually, this is not something new uh, for us. Mondelez has always been at the forefront of you know marrying creativity and technology. We've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, of course there's an accelerated movement that has happened around it in the more recent times and like already uh, sandeep and ishwinder spoke about it the consumer landscape has dramatically changed and that's led to a lot of you know focus from our side also on digital platforms we've had some very very successful campaigns in the recent few years uh, the one that you're talking about uh, the diwali ad that we released recently it actually the genesis of that started somewhere in last diwali where apart from our business we realized that a lot of local businesses were also significantly impacted by the pandemic and we wanted to do uh, something for them as well so last year when we launched the campaign we did it by mapping close to 1800 pin codes and local stores and directing people to you know stores close to their home where they could shop you know truly making it localized and helping them you know also have a great diwali this year we wanted to take it a step further and uh, through ai facial recognition uh, and partnerships on this whole deep fake technology we managed to create an ad where you can get shahrukh khan to mimic his entire facial expressions his voice um his emotions everything and create an ad for yourself or your store and then you know share it with uh, people around you so i think in our own little way we've tried to give back to you know uh, some of our partners and uh, it's this is just one of the campaigns we also have a campaign called madbury that we run every year which has very deep consumer engagement where we actually get our consumers to co-create a product with us so we've been constantly doing something or the other in the space of digital to enable consumer experiences which are much much more richer um, and given the situation that we are in today technology helps you enable a lot of that absolutely i think ravi on the same lines i think hdfc also you know has been leveraging the power of technology uh to amplify your brand purpose and you have an iconic tagline we understand your world so so how do you think about you know this approach of using technology to amplify brand purpose and ethos namaste as uh, anjali was talking about it's all about engaging with the customers and then we just expand with the digital saying engaging with the customer at the right time with the right context at the end of the day we have a suite of products available and each of these products may not be relevant for the customer at every point of time and there are certain points relevant at that certain context and today what is available to all of us as marketers is this phenomenal 
availability of data to understand the context in which the consumer is engaging with your brand. And if you're not going to leverage that context, then your messaging is not going to necessarily appeal to that customer. So the entire way in which we see it is understand the context of the consumer, use the data that you already have. And uh, I can look at the other three of the people in the panel and we can say, yes, they, they know about their consumers more from the physical research they do. They don't have any data about their consumers. Tominos will have definitely a lot better than say, for example, a Mondelez or a, you know, but we have everything about you. So today, the way I see this, HDFC Bank is a very trustworthy bank. And if you are saying that it is trust, and then we go back to consumers, ask them, how do you define this trust? The trust has changed its meaning. It's no more keep my money safe. It says, you have so much of information about me. Talk with me about the most relevant thing that I need to do or I need to have today. Don't talk to me generally. Don't come and tell me this brand can do wonders for your life. And I don't need any of those things at this point of time. So we need to understand that context using the data that we have. And how do you leverage that data to go back to the consumers? And how do we actually not lose sight of the consumer in this data-driven experience also? So I think it's a mix of the data and the consumer inciting and how do you bring it together and reach out. And the way we reach out is all about one-on-one -on -one personalization. And the amount of personalization that we do, and for example, the kind of campaigns that we do, which is more to our own customer base, I don't need to necessarily go to TV and shout because we know our customers. We have their mobiles, we have their email IDs, we have everything about them. They come into our offices, they come into our branches. So we don't necessarily need to use mass media per se, but when we use whatever mediums that you have, you need to make sure that it is not a spam. It's very, very engaging. And it requires a lot of understanding of both the context in which the consumer in, which the data can give you, and then making even the messaging in line with the context. So what we have done in the last 18 months in terms of pivoting towards more and more digital conversations with the customers, I, I think we have reached a lot of stage. I, we have spent a huge amount of effort and energy to understand data, to understand what happens and what does this data signify? And we are now trying to shape behavior. We are not more predicting behavior. I think that's passe. What we are looking for is if this is how a consumer has done A, and if you have seen that over the period of the last six years, six months, what is it that I can do with another consumer who are just six months prior to this? So how do I shape the behavior in terms of making sure they take the better financial decision? Because our final goal is to make sure that every choice which a consumer makes is the best financial decision for that consumer. So it's, it's all about how do we use the data? How do we use the human context that comes out of the data? How do you marry the two? And how do you reach out to consumers? Yeah, and I think it's interesting how you also talk about how this data is not just for the here and now, right? But also predictive in some way to help consumers make better decisions. And even, you know, how as a brand, you think of similar customer cohorts to predict uh, for the future. So, yeah, I think the use of data is absolutely, you know, the key. And I think, like you uh, said, uh, I mean, Domino's is another brand which would have a lot of this rich data. So I think, Sandeep, over to you to, you know, really understand uh, how does data inform your marketing strategy at Domino's and how are you thinking about it? So uh, I think I'll borrow from what Ravi also said. Consumers now want a more personalized experience and uh, they are no, no longer okay with a broad brushstroke which was okay maybe five years ago uh, or maybe even three years ago, but no longer that's the case. And therefore, it's very important to understand consumers and put them into cohorts, I would say. Create those cohorts, create those personas and tailor make your offering. If not your offering in terms of say the menu mix, but for sure in terms of the kind of benefits you give them, whether it's in form of discounting or whether it's in form of uh, the engagement which you do when you reach out to them via CRM or digital, you tailor make your communication uh, basis their own preferences. These personas are actually good for both consumers as well as for businesses because consumers prefer them because they feel that someone who knows them, understands them, is talking the right thing, which is probably relevant to them. And it must be highly true in a banking business for sure. Uh, and But it's as true in any other industry, I would say. 
why it's good for business when you have an engaged consumer uh, and when you have a consumer who is hooked on to you or listens to you they tend to transact more from a business point of view it really makes sense to uh, have this and 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 like in any business i think once you've got the customer the once you've got the user your journey does not end there with ever increasing app download space uh, app download basis it's very important that we also work on the retention track and the churn prevention track which is what we actively do at dominos at one end we focus on increasing the app base at the other end we are also focused on ensuring that the churn is kept to the minimum and retention is also a priority especially for the select set of consumers who would be high frequency etc Got it, Sandeep. So switching gears and you know going back to um, Ishwinder, um, let's talk a little bit about you know um, your category and you know it's it's a it's a captivating space and um, there's a very special relationship uh, that uh, your category has with the, both Bollywood and cricket, um, especially given the aspirational nature of your messaging. And both of these spaces actually saw a slowdown uh, during the pandemic. Uh, they are, of course, on a path to recovery now. But given this uh, slowdown that happened, uh, what changed for you in terms of customer insights and media planning uh, in this time frame? Look, uh, you're absolutely correct, Vasudha. We do a lot of interactive work, okay, with both Bollywood and cricket. However, what really gave us confidence during this slowdown was that there was not really a drop in consumer interest. but there was a sub- supply side issue in terms of a lack of fresh content which was coming because of covid restrictions in place so what we really had to do was we had to just go back and look at historically what are the kind of assets we already had in place so let me give you a small example we have this beautiful asset bank of royal stag barrel select large short firms okay which are award winning short firms and we took them out and we've seen a great amount of consumer interaction you know this year in that asset bank and that helped us engage with consumers at a time when no future no fresh content was really coming their way that's the first example second example was let's let's look at fashion okay and blender sprite fashion tour is a physical event however because of lockdown we again went back to our asset bank and we found this we had a lot of rich content already with us and what we really did was we played that content with consumers in digital and we learned from those from how consumers engaged with us the minute we put out those content and from those learnings we in fact have created a new set of assets which is for example the showcase which is currently on which is a emerging talent hunt okay for all the fresh challenge which comes into the fashion industry and we used our historical learnings to even do activations with world cup so our learnings from digital our learnings from consumers we've in fact seen a huge spike in our consumer engagement rates and we actively track our performance on social conversation and on share of voice along us to constantly assess the level of consumer engagement and that's something i think we've learned during the lockdown period interesting and again you know i think it goes back to the thread of agility and innovation uh, and how i think everyone had to rethink their uh, you know approach uh, because of the constraints we were operating in i think on that same note anjali um, even you know for you it it's so critical to know and understand your consumers and especially when you're taking new products to market so during the pandemic right with all the volatility how did you gauge consumer reaction and get a pulse check especially when stores were not open not accessible um so how did you go about it at montelays so there is different ways in which we approach it we do have digital panels that we work with and uh, we have an insights and analytics team that uh, does consumer connects virtually so while you are not able to actually go to the customer and see what is happening um face to face you can still connect with them and get a sense and a pulse of what consumers are uh thinking and doing and you know the way that they are looking at our brands 
The other way that we've been looking at uh, getting some sort of a pulse on consumers is through uh, some of our campaigns that we run online and we're collecting a lot of uh, data through those campaigns. Uh, some of it is third party data, some of it is first party data. And that also kind of informs our decision making. So I would say that, yes, it is a little different from the world that we used to operate in before, where it was more face to face interaction with the consumer, but you're still able to gauge what consumers want and how they are, you know, leaning towards your brands through digital ways of connecting. Um, Anuja, what's your take on this? Uh, so, Vasudha, I think that there was a very, uh, you know, life challenge uh, to the industry. But I think at GCPL, we were very quick to realize that, you know, just how we as humans and I think we as marketers or as the as the business fraternity had very quickly jumped through the virtual world to continue, you know, to ensure business continuity and to continue, uh, you know, working on all aspects of the business. Likewise, we ensured that, you know, we really kind of tighten our uh, association with the consumers and with our retail partners and ensure that, you know, learnings and insights and more importantly, understand what they're feeling kept coming through. So, you know, we literally kind of, you know, were doing, uh, you know, almost about 50 hours of, you know, consumer immersions uh, through the virtual platforms, um, you know, and I think the only thing that you kind of do miss out at that time is, you know, being in the living room of the consumer, you know, kind of just, you know, uh, immersing yourselves in the environment. But I think the virtual uh, platforms uh, did, a, did a fairly strong, uh, you know, I'd say surrogate uh, to the real experience because I think there was also a time when consumers were also yearning to be heard. You know, I think there were a lot more, um, uh, you know, I'd say uh, articulate and a lot more, uh, uh, you know, uh, vocal about what they needed and how they were trying to deal with the situation. So, uh, you know, every time, uh, you know, when I and my team were speaking to the consumers, we, we, we heard a lot of, um, uh, you know, in interesting um, feedback, you know, interesting points of views and very interesting perspectives. You know, we were all, I think, as humans struggling with, uh, uh, you know, a, a black swan event like this of this magnitude for the first time. Uh, and so I think we all related with each other. But, you know, when you kind of connect with consumers, even though virtually, and, you know, you ensure that you're kind of maintaining that pulse, uh, it definitely, uh, you know, helped us a great deal. And it, it also helped us a great deal, Vasuka, because, you know, we were innovating at breakneck speed, you know, we, uh, I think the industry at large, which would, you know, typically have an average, uh, you know, stage gate or innovation timelines of 12 to 18 months on the lower side, suddenly was, you know, now launching categories within 60 to 75 days. And it was extremely important that, you know, we were not letting go of some of the critical steps of, uh, you know, consumer testing, you know, of ensuring that, you know, we, we did the right, uh, the right level of uh, uh, you know deliberation on on getting a pulse of the consumer on not just our products right but also the overall behavior change um, and I think that that way is you know the whole shift towards the virtual platforms uh, and you know leveraging technology was a big plus. And I think uh, since we are on you know this whole topic of uh, consumer insights. I think, uh, Sandeep, going back to you, right? Um, I mean, a lot of these consumer insights then feed into the whole marketing approach and especially into something like the notion of moment-based marketing. So um, I think Domino's seems to be a great believer in that, right? There have been a lot of campaigns this year where you've responded at lightning speed uh, when it comes to specific moments, right? Where it was, for example, your Hat how India vaccine, like our India campaign around vaccinations, uh, or during the Olympics when you engaged with uh, Mirabai Chanu during that time, how do you strategize to capture uh, these moments and consumer attention um, in these uh, peak moments? So, uh, this is something which is we as a strategy kind of follow. We have had a huge practice, I would say, in the past wherein we have associated or uh, <clears throat> talked about events, festivals, and talked in a language which consumer would relate to. So movement marketing uh, no, as a calendar is something which is an integral part of our calendar and tied to events, et cetera, which happen in the calendar year. Apart from that, for a brand like us, which is more youth oriented, which has to generate conversations with people, it's very important that we keep our ear close to the ground and pick up these opportunities which come 
to converse with our consumers in the language and in the to- on the topic which they want to for example when it came to the hath bada campaign vaccination was the talk which every consumer was having either at home or with their friends it was something which was everywhere and <clears throat> that became a platform for us to talk to our consumer of course the filter which we applied was is it something which is good for our consumer and by that same logic for the country the answer was yes was it something which would have enhanced our brand image because we were talking about a topic which was very relevant at that point in time the answer is yes another filter which we apply is that we have to be authentic and that is even when we did the hath padao campaign we put our skin in the game and we said that we will incentivize for every consumer or user who actually brings forward their hand to get vaccinated by coming forward and also incentivizing them for getting vaccinated so it's a mix of these three things and <clears throat> some of them are uh, well thought through in advance and planned for given they are more calendarized some of them are spur of the moment like meera bai chanu was almost like spur of the moment and uh, when it happened everything kind of the our response to it was closed within 15 minutes i think that was the big differentiator the agility of it really made all the difference we as a brand were really proud of the fact that she had won olympic gold medal olympic medal for the country and we were very proud and we went ahead and uh, therefore responded to her request of or her want of having a pizza that day with an announcement of that you you can have a dominos pizza for a lifetime uh, in fact we went ahead and actually uh, that same day given that she was in tokyo while her family uh, was in india we went ahead and <clears throat> delivered some pizzas to her family the same very day in the night which she really appreciated but it's also necessary to keep your ear on the ground plus you have to be agile because if you don't do that you miss out on those movements and some of those movements and uh, if if uh, it's almost like whoever capitalizes on them first or whoever responds to them first they actually kind of benefit the most so it was a mix of both for us so that's great to understand right the whole notion of it's obviously about agility but also authenticity so thank you for sharing that sandeep thank you um going back uh, to you ishwinder um let's talk a little bit about you know some of the iconic properties um you have like blender's pride fashion tour uh, which was severely disrupted during the pandemic uh, so how did you go about engaging with your consumers then at such a time uh, in the absence of you know um, some of these iconic properties being able to sort of function the way they were earlier yeah the case, the good thing and i will i'll take uh a word which sandeep talked about okay which was about authenticity okay it's important that we that we had built you know we had been we had built credibility in the fashion industry over the last 15 years of doing blender spike fashion tour and it had become an annual an annual event however with covid what really happened was that obviously everything shut down however the consumer hunger okay did not go away so we knew that we had to do things differently the world of fashion was also severely impacted by the pandemic and in that lay a huge challenge but also a huge opportunity for us we decided to do things differently okay so we went in we tested new ways of doing things and what we really did was we learned on the go we did a digital blender spike fashion tour which has never happened before okay with tarun telyani in early october 2020 where he was looking at celebrating 25 years of his iconic label okay so we did a fashion show real time it was a digital fashion premiere event and which basically just was brand new and it elevated the experience of fashion events for our target consumers so our consumers were hungry for this they were waiting for this and we came with a solution which basically latched on to the growing online media consumption during the lockdown okay so this year we went a step ahead and we picked up a digital version of showcase which is a talent hunt of india's finest emerging fashion talent in association with fashion development Co- uh, council of india and again it's been a huge success for us so we test we learn and then we expand our consumer outreach by doing things differently during the pandemic 
I just want to share one more example. Uh, on a brand called 100 Pipers, we've been doing something called the Legacy Project. And a lot of people had, in fact, got impacted because the arts of India, okay, certain arts of India were under stress because of low consumer interest. And what happened during the pandemic was they lost a lot of their consumers. We again took up the cause. We worked on it with our packaging and we took it to our consumers. Again, we brought it back center stage and again supported the dying arts of India. So again, what really happened was a lot of consumers had an outreach and even the people who were the artists really got supported by you know, the property. So that's how we've done really things differently. We've gone into the digital world. We've also expanded the outreach of our, uh, you know, of our properties. And I don't think we'll ever go back to a place where it will be purely physical or it will be just purely digital. I think we will, we've evolved to a digital world in terms of our properties. Great. And I think, uh, I mean, that's a great example of, you know, how technology has been a huge boon in bridging the gaps uh, that came up in the last 20 months. Uh, so on that note, Ravi, do you have a similar instance which you could share where the agility that digital and mobile technology bring has empowered your brand? Yeah, sure. See, as pandemic struck, as Sandeep was saying, we obviously cannot offer free money but we have to look at what consumers were going through at that time. So we did a lot of things for our consumers. Like for example, no minimum balance requirement during that period. You don't have to pay necessarily for withdrawing cash from some other bank's ATM. We removed that because people are not willing to travel for a longer distance to go back to an HDFC bank ATM. We had a huge footfall coming into the branches. We have more than 5,600 branches and 16,000 ATMs. So we started working with senior citizens because they were the ones who were most impacted. And <clears throat> so we started giving doorstep banking and in addition we enabled everything what we could do necessarily physically by way of digital the video kyc which the regulator announced we were one of the first in the quickest to start off with that so that many of the things that require kyc for a consumer to get we started doing it by way of video kyc and the adoption is also very good the challenge has always been how quickly we can come out with many of these stuff rather than how whether consumer will adopt. Because in my view, this is more of a supply constrained economy on this side rather than a demand constrained economy. Consumers are willing to adopt most of these stuff. And we need to make sure that we give the right digital tools in an easy way for the consumers to adopt. And today, the amount of video KYC that is happening in the banking ecosystem is far higher than the physical KYC that was happening because almost everything we added a physical KYC earlier and now with the advent of the pandemic and because of the pandemic necessarily, video KYC people have started adopting. So in a way, it's all about leveraging for the benefit of the customer, whatever you see as the context in which the business is operate. Yeah, and I think like you rightly said, right, I think regulation also was forced to keep up uh, with this disruption because there was literally no option. Uh, I think we've heard some great examples of, uh, you know, digital innovation, use of technology. Uh, so Anjali, over to you on, you know, what innovation are you most excited about uh, from a brand perspective when it comes to digital? Because there's a lot happening in the market, right, with uh, with now live commerce, with uh, new identity solutions, building immersive experiences for consumers on, you know, things like gaming and OTT and so many things. So what's, what's really exciting to you from a brand perspective when it comes to these innovations? I think, first of all, the evolution of digital itself in the market is happening so rapidly that uh, keeping pace with that itself is exciting for us. But having said that, I think from a CPG perspective and a brands and business perspective for us, a uh, couple of things that I think are going to be disruptive is one is that, uh, you know, we, for, for people like us, we will be moving from more probabilistic uh, audience based approaches to more deterministic, you know, audience approaches. And we can see a lot of e-commerce platforms today enabling that with their own DSPs. So that's an exciting space for us from a business standpoint. The other thing is that largely we view social for driving brand equity and uh, with the emergence of social commerce, uh, that will be another great space to watch out for. 
and uh, unlike sandeep and ravi who sit on uh, rich data capital of their consumers uh, cpg industry has been a little slow on that front and you know we've been reliant on third party data so the industry itself will shift towards first party data requiring us to you know uh, have our own consumer data capital our own consumer data platforms and that's another space that i'm really really looking forward to so yeah that's where it is for us so anuja what is it to like what is it like to get mcommerce ready uh, when you're pushing out new products in you know the short time spans that you talked about earlier yeah um because do you it, it's different right uh, in building brand royalty and gaining share of wallet in an environment like mobile commerce compared to an offline consumer experience what has your experience been on this uh, i think it's been a steep learning curve asata particularly for uh, you know for the fmcg industry which has always been extremely heavy uh, you know in terms of its uh, dependence on the general trade uh you know what what really happened and, and while general trade continues to be the largest contributor even now but i think just the scale of uh, uh you know of of behavior change that we saw you know during those uh, i'd say 6 to 9 months from even the consumer end of adopting uh you know e-commerce and and m-commerce particularly uh you know towards meeting their needs obviously meant that you know we needed to change our pace and vector of thinking you know and instead of thinking you know store placement and large stores literally you know imagining the brands and and the category as a very uh, you know a digitally native uh, entrant uh, and being mobile first you know versus kind of adapting for mobile so you know this was no longer a time where you know we were looking to adapt uh, our offerings to the m commerce Uh, uh ecosystem rather you know we were actually sort of designing for that system and when i say we were designing for the system you know right from the you know the the product categories to the way we were looking to target the consumers on various ends of the you know on various ends of the funnel you know right from our you know mass demand generation whether that be search led uh, you know uh, or sort of let's say contextual targeting to even some of our uh, you know uh, you know middle or lower end uh, you know bottom of the funnel uh, 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 you know marketing in inter interventions were all very targeted at eventually you know leading to conversions on mobile commerce you know so uh, everything you know from the way we kind of built out our websites in a manner you know in a matter of literally about 2 to 3 weeks on some of our new brands was everything very mobile first and i think in that sense it's been a steep learning curve uh, you know for all of the marketing fraternity but i'd say it was a much needed um, uh, you know i think it was much needed jolt also right because uh, we knew always right that the that the digital ecosystem was moving ahead uh, you know at a certain pace possibly the the rate of acceleration uh, became phenomenal at this time but i think the fraternity and consumers at large right have Uh, adopted very well this this entire new uh, experience and obviously you know as marketers we always kind of follow or possibly preempt where the consumers are going uh, and in this case it was really about ensuring that you know we were matching footsteps with the consumers and this also meant that you know we partnered very closely with you know the mobile commerce um, uh, you know ecosystem partners you know we understood trends from them you know we understood how consumers are making purchases our purchases for the hygiene category becoming any different you know whether it be frequency whether it be the way the you know whether it be the way consumers are making the brand choices uh, are some of those you know sort of drastically changing and we obviously saw a very uh, you know different funnel of purchase uh, evolve vasta during this time yeah. which is surely i think here to stay uh, you know as as a trend yeah oh absolutely right i think you know the disruption that happened the pace at which it happened yeah uh, is not a short term behavior anymore right i think it's it means it's a shift in the landscape and consumer behavior which has happened and we will see that to you know continuing in the next couple of years so absolutely i think this was not a one time shift or a one time you know um okay. um before we go um i think it's very rare to have such a great panel of people behind india's biggest brands and i'm sure Uh, a lot of uh, you know aspiring leaders are keenly listening into today's session so uh, if you had to share your top tip uh, with them on building resilient brands uh, what would you say to them um, anuja what's your take on this 
Oh, Masuda, I've you know I've I've answered this question a couple of times, so uh, you know, pardon me if if it sounds like deja vu, but I think I really stick by my uh, you know um, experience on this one. But I'd say you know these are also times when sometimes as a marketer you might be tempted to or almost feel uh, you know a little pushed to uh, you know try to change the brand narrative. And I just say that you know it's extremely important. All the more in a time like this, that you know you stay very true to what your brand stands for. You know, we saw a lot of brands actually jump out of character. You know, uh, to try to play to the gallery. Uh, you know, during the time of COVID, and it was not very well received by consumers, right? So I think authenticity of your narrative, I'd, I'd say, you know, to all marketers and you know to all all uh, all young uh, marketers, particularly, right? Authenticity of narrative. is something that you have to ensure you always hold on to and i'll just give you a very quick example of that vasuka you know we've got a brand called synthol right which is all about exploration it's all about you know getting uh, you know seeking the best experiences that the world has to offer and obviously at a time like the lockdown right uh, exploration was far uh, you know was far from uh, you know from reality at that point but what we you know continue to do is that you know we said the brand still will continue to stand for exploration but instead of you know real you know sort of uh, encouraging people to you know reach out for real explorations at this time you know how about we actually get the entire community together because what we also heard from all our you know consumer emotions was that the one thing that people were really craving and missing uh, you know was travel and exploration and you know kind of heading out on holidays and so on and this was an interesting time we built a very large community called the synthol awesome explorers and you know we got kind of got these travelers together to share nostalgia you know to to share just about some of their past travel experiences and just reignite the love for uh, travel and exploration amongst the larger community and you know to me i thought i thought there was a very strong uh, you know point of view from a brand despite the fact that you know exploration was far from uh, 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 you know reality at, at at that point in time but the brand didn't really lose its essence so i'd always say that you know given whatever the scenario may be and more so i think in times like these where consumers you know are extremely discerning to you know see through um, a brand's narrative stay authentic oh, sandeep i would actually uh, just give two maybe that's what something and both of them marry each other in a way so the first and foremost i think if you want to build a resilient brand you have to have a very very good understanding of your consumer and by the way that understanding changes like for brands uh, and maybe anjali can voice vouch for it and even every one of us can voice voice for vouch for it that two years ago what was our understanding of consumers uh, and the understanding which we have today is very different and if you miss out on this these pivotal moments or black swan events or whatever that case may be which change consumer behaviors forever then your brand is as good as dead so as a marketer or as one as someone who takes care of brands you cannot ever take the consumer for granted that's the first one which i would have to say the second one which i would have i would necessarily say and part of it has been covered in today's discussion is your brand has to be authentic and your brand has to come across as a meaningful authentic brand and make the consumer's life better in any way so for example ravi talked about uh, all those things which hdfc did to make kyc better anjali talked about small businesses even ashwinder talked about many things so all of our, all of these brands have actually made consumers life better they are really impacting their lives in some way or the other in their own spheres of course not every brand will be able to influence every sphere of the consumer or whatever the chosen chosen sphere which they have you need to make sure that you impact the consumer in a positive way those for me are the two things which can really ensure that you have a resilient and a brand which is there for ages <clears throat> and brands which consumers love so completely echo what sandeep said yes uh, be invested in your consumer need to have authenticity to your purpose but i think the other thing that you need to do to build resilient brand is to be uh invested in you know your brand strategies and uh, build on your distinctive assets very often the temptation is there to kind of you know move away from what you have been doing 
and uh, try something new and disruptive. Uh, consistency is very, very key, I think, to building resilience uh, for your brands and for your categories. So that's my perspective. Building on authenticity, but also consistency and, you know, uh, building, taking up the assets you already have and taking that to the next level. Um, Ravi, your take on this? Just a point of view, because I think uh, what pandemic taught us is uh, this resilience is not the word to use anymore. It's anti-fragile mm. because resilient only allows you to bounce back without learning anything and you're just not breaking. Whereas anti-fragility, as Taleb calls it, it's all about what did you learn because of which you'll be better off going forward. And obviously, the foundation doesn't change, whether it is the authenticity that you require for, whether it is the distinctive assets that you have created and you want to do. So the most interesting thing and important thing for me is like, how are you going to marry in this data rich world, the human inciting, which people seem to miss a lot nowadays, because I think everybody is moving towards the data, 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 data. I keep telling my team that there is a flesh and blood behind that data. Do you know them? Do you feel them? Do you have a feel about what they are feeling? So how I'm going to mix empathy in digital. And that's the biggest uh, thing that I'm looking for in terms of how do I get empathy in the digital world? Interesting. Interesting. So to authenticity and consistency, we also add the element of empathy in digital because you cannot get too carried away by data uh, as well. right? Uh, and we need to maintain that element as a brand. Um, Ishwinder, uh, from you, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'll have a go at it. Uh, I think uh, I agree with everybody you know, on the panel, it's extremely important for brands to address a consumer pain point. And you have to be purposeful in that. The empathy portion, which Ravi talked about, is extremely important. And authenticity, because it is your unique proposition to the consumer, which has to come from a authentic consumer insight. What is the unique thing you're addressing in a consumer's life is something you have to take it to the consumer. Please add a dose of creativity in today's digital world. Data is too much, but creativity is what breaks the clutter. And please create a narrative that is relevant and consistent over time, but also agile to the changes which happen in the market around you. So a lot of things which have been called out, but I think authenticity, purposeful, empathetic, okay, and a consistent communication over time is what builds resilient brands. Thanks, Ishwanda. Thank you for that. Um, with that, I think, uh, you know, we'll call it a wrap. Um, I think we talked about a lot of interesting things today. I think uh, the whole notion of how the pandemic disrupted but caused a lot of innovation uh, in its wake when it came to marketing. It was very evident in all the examples that were shared today, whether it was about moment-based marketing or how regulation and customer behavior changed uh, in the banking industry or how consumer inciting and media planning itself uh, went a massive change, or even in the um, alcohol beverage category, how properties which were purely physical moved to the notion of digital. So, and then I think some interesting examples came out on marrying creativity with technology. But I think at the end, what you know, you guys wrapped up in terms of what builds resilient or anti-fragile brands uh, is really you know things around authenticity, around consistency, around being purposeful uh, and empathy. I think these obviously will stand the test of time, right? No matter what the situation may be. So, thank you guys for sharing those thoughts. Um, I hope that, you know, the audience uh, will really benefit from the insightful and rich discussion that we had today. Uh, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us today and making time for this discussion. Um, it was really, really great to have you on board uh, for this uh, inaugural um, discussion of Masters of Marketing Roundtable for 2022. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you, Vasita. Thank you. Thank you, Rasuda. Thank, Thank you, Rasuda. Thank you, Rasuda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.